Take your Bibles, go back with me to John chapter number 14. I see a couple of new faces here. Let me explain what we do. We take books of the Bible and we go verse by verse, word for word through them. And we've been in the Gospel of John for some time and we've been in chapter 14 for quite some time as well. I am not going to lie to you. I have... I've taught through the New Testament multiple times over the years. I've taught through much of the Old Testament. I'm not sure if I've taught through all of the Old Testament, but I've, I've covered most of it, I believe. And I don't know of a passage of Scripture that I have found to be a harder text of Scripture to teach than John 14. It, it has been, this is two weeks now on these uh, handful of verses that, I, to be honest with you, I've really struggled over. Not necessarily to understand or to be able to interpret what each um, verse, each phrase is necessarily saying. The, the struggle is more about the bird's eye view, the big picture, the goal, the, the flow of the text. Uh, I struggle with that. But I think the, and so this is, uh, you know, over the last, last week we talked about the manifestation of God as, as well. And this week we will too over the next couple of verses that we're going to be looking at. And I don't think that's a wrong perspective. It could be, so don't, don't take me to the bank on this, but I don't think that that's a wrong uh, perspective. And as I had mentioned last week, I always know when other Bible scholars struggle over a text. I own dozens of um, commentaries on the Gospel of John. Some of you, someone came in my office this week, the office over there, and it was the first time they'd been in my office. They're like, look at all the books you have in here which I always laugh because that's not my study office. I, that's, my study office is at home, and that's, that's the books that didn't make the cut. That's the books I don't use. And I do own a lot of books, thousands of books. And I always know that when I come across a text that other Bible scholars, other theologians really struggle with, and the reason I know that is because they will always write chapters on that text, and they're so different from each other. They'll have an entirely different outline. And what that tells me is, is like, yeah, they're just, they're kind of making it up as they go as well. And it's not necessarily that they're struggling with the meaning of each phrase. It's just, what's the big picture? What's the flow of this? And particularly when it comes to Jesus and his teachings, that's not always easy to come to because, well, as someone once said after hearing Jesus, no man ever spoke like this man. There is no one you've ever read that says things the way Jesus says them. You have never listened to a great orator who speaks the way Jesus speaks or thinks the way Jesus thinks or goes as deep. Certainly, as we've been studying the Gospel of John, some of you have come to the same conclusion that I have, that it doesn't matter how long you ponder or meditate on the words of Jesus, you're still only scratching the surface of the depth of truth and knowledge that he gives. And he always does it in such a way to where he uses just a, a handful of words. It would take me hours to say some of the profound things that Jesus could say in three or four words. It just blows my mind how he does that. Well, he's God, and he's infinitely wise, and his knowledge is infinite. And as we ponder his truth, we have to time and time again question, so what, what are exactly are you getting to? What, what is the deeper truth here? And John 14 is certainly a chapter that exercises that discipline more so than I would say in many, many other passages that I've studied. Well, before I, we left off at verse 17 last week, and I want to read verse 18. I want to begin John 14, verse number 18 this morning. Before I read this verse, though, I want, to, I want to say that I think I have a new title for it. Not, not saying that I've invented a new title, but I, I think there is a new name for Jesus given here, a new title given for Jesus, not one that I have personally heard. And the Bible has hundreds of titles for Jesus. You can go through the Old Testament, there are titles for Jesus. All throughout the New Testament, titles for Jesus. The Gospel of John itself is filled with titles of Jesus. We've seen many of them. In John chapter number 1, he is called the Word, the Logos. In John chapter number 6, he is called the Bread of Life. In John 1, he is also called the King of the Jews. In John chapter number 10, he is called the Door of the Sheep. Also in John chapter number 10, he is called the Good Shepherd. 
In John chapter 1 as well, he is called the Lamb of God. In John 9, he is called the Light of the World. In John 3, he is called the Good Rabbi. In John 11, he is called the Resurrection and the Life. In John 1, once again, he is called the Only Begotten Son. In John 15, he is called the True Vine. And as we saw last week in John 14 and verse number 6, Jesus himself called him called himself the way, the truth, and the life. But when we read verse 18, I think you could, give, you could give Jesus this title, the good father. And you might say, well, there's no way you could give Jesus the title good father because the father is the father and the son is the son, and so you can't call Jesus the good father. However, notice what Jesus says in verse number 18. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. Twenty-three times in this chapter, the Father is spoken of, God the Father in heaven. And of those twenty-three times, the vast majority of those references to God the Father are references implying and teaching and describing Jesus as being one with the Father. As he told Philip in verse number 9, he says, He who has seen me has seen the Father. He's telling Philip, along with Thomas, along with Peter, along with the rest of the men sitting around that table in the upper room, he's saying, if you're looking at me, you are looking at God the Father. He tells Thomas, how, how is it I've been with you so long and you don't see me? And so in this chapter itself, Jesus is again and again and again, teaching the truth that Jesus and God the Father are one and the same. This is where that title of last week's sermon, as well as this week's, God manifested. Jesus is God manifested. God is a spirit, the Bible tells us. And so God, who is spirit, God the Father, who is spirit, manifested himself on earth. This is called God the Son. He is a triune God. Now, this is where a lot of other religions struggle, you know, Islam struggles with Christianity over this point, Judaism struggles with Christianity over this point. We believe in one God, just as those religions and others teach, one God. However, we say he is three parts, same God, three individuals, yet one. He is Father, Son, Holy Spirit uniquely, distinctly different from one another, and yet, at the same time, absolutely one in essence, one and the same. Now, that is not a hard truth to understand. It is an impossible truth to understand, and it is one that can only be understood by faith. There is no way that I, as a Bible teacher, could stand up here and explain to you logically, rationally, how God is one and yet three persons. And the Bible does not go out of its way to try to give a rational, logical explanation to that reality either. The Bible just simply presents it as true. The Bible presents God as one and yet three he is Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Bible never, like I said, goes out of its way to define that or explain that. It is simply just a matter of truth. It is something you believe. I, I can't defend it other than that's what the Bible says. And I'm going to choose not to ignore or not believe what the Bible says. And so it is true. And so when Jesus says to his disciples, If I am God and you have seen me, you have also seen God the Father, we are one and the same. And so he can very easily, in verse number 18, say, I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. When he says, I will not leave you orphans, this, this is him playing the role of a father. I am leaving, but I'm not going to be a bad parent. I'm going to be a good father to you. I will come again. I will not, I will not abandon you. I have to depart for just a temporary amount of time. They're, they're going to arrest me. I'm, there's going to be this mock trial. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be buried. I, I'm going to be in the grave for three days. I will resurrect after that, and you will see me again. I, I have to leave for just a little bit, but I'm not leaving you as orphans. I will come to you again. 
In verse number 19, he says this, A little while longer, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live. You will live also. At that day, and the day that he's referring to is the day that he lives, verse number 19, that's how he ended verse number 19, because I live. So he says, at that day, at the day that I live again, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. Look at that amazing unity between us and God. Which, as hard as it is to comprehend, God is one and yet three. It's far harder, for me at least, um, from a theological perspective, to define how is it that I could be in God and God could be in me. There's, I wouldn't even know where to begin trying to grasp the understanding of that. And yet that's what he says. And that's only because of our communion, our, our being united with Christ through his death, his burial, his resurrection, his sacrifice, his substitutionary atonement for us, being brought in, grafted into him. But I want, I want to point out something in those three verses, verse 18, 19, and 20. The subject matter, or the emphasis here, is you. You may have not caught that initially, but I'll point it out to you again. I will not leave you, he says in verse 18. I will come to you, he says. Verse number 19, he says, A little while longer and the world will not see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. Verse 20, he says, At that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and I in you, or in you and me, and I in you. Use the emphasis here. Use an individual, a believer, a follower of Christ. And notice the contrast between you and the world, verse number 19, a little while longer and the world will see me no longer. So there's this, there's this difference between, as he mentions there, verse number 18, the difference between the, the children of the world and the children of God. He says, I'm your spiritual father. I'll not abandon you. I will not leave you as, uh, as orphans. I will come to you because you're my children and I love you as my children. And you will see me, you will know me, you will live. But the world, however, the world, as as Jesus told the Pharisees, you are of your father, Satan. So you have the children of Satan, you have the children of the devil, and you have the children of God. And he has pointed out to these disciples that they are the children of God. And that they will not be abandoned by God, and that they will see God, that they will know God, and that they will live with God. That's what he's telling them. You will see God, you will know God, you will live with God. Because God is your heavenly Father. But verse number 19, once again, the world will see him no more. God manifested himself on earth physically as the man, Jesus. And once again, this is a a very difficult thing to wrap your mind around. Jesus was 100% man, without question. And yet, he was 100% God. And no, that is not 200%. He's he's just, he's both. Rationally, logically, once again, that is not something that can be defined or explained. It's just simply true. Jesus is 100% man, and I say is, not was, because Jesus is alive in his resurrected body. He is sitting at the right hand of the Father, ever interceding on our part. So Jesus is 100% man. He has a physical body, although it is a glorified body at this point. It is still a physical body. And he is 100% God. And God walked among us. That's that old, we talked about names at the beginning of this. Uh, that, that Old Testament title given to him, Emmanuel, God with us. That was what was prophesied of the Messiah. So God would walk among us. That God is Jesus. Jesus walked among his created beings. This is what John chapter 1 tells us, that he came into his own and his own did not receive him. They didn't know him. They didn't recognize him. They abandoned him. He created them, and yet they didn't recognize their creator when he walked among them. So Jesus, who is God, put on flesh, 
walked among us, and we beheld the glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. We beheld the glory of God himself. When we saw Jesus, we saw God. When we heard the words of Jesus, we heard the words of God. When we looked into the eyes of Jesus, we looked into the eyes of God. All of Jerusalem, as he, as he traveled up and down, as he preached to the masses in the Galilean regions, as he went down into the southern Judea region, as he preached all throughout Jerusalem, People saw God, they heard God, they witnessed the, the deeds and the works and the actions of God. But that window of time, which was only about three years of public ministry, that little window of time was very quickly closing. And Jesus tells his disciples, the world will no longer see God. And that's physically speaking, the world will no longer see God. Because I won't be here. I'll ascend into heaven. He, you remember he's on the Mount of Olives and he ascends into heaven and he tells his disciples, go spread the gospel till I return again. So the world will no longer physically see Jesus until he comes again a second time. So the world won't see God. But the promise to God's children, the promise to these disciples is, you will see God, you will know God, you will live with God. So that leads to three additional questions based beyond the ones that I asked last week, which last week uh, we, we dealt with Jesus and the manifestation of God on earth. We dealt with the church that serves as a manifestation of God on earth. Just very quickly touch on that. Jesus has ascended to the Father. He has left us his body. We are the body of Christ. We are the hands and feet of Jesus. We are, in essence, a manifestation of God. We are not the manifestation of God. We are a manifestation of God. And we manifest God in the deeds that we do. We manifest God in the prayers that we pray. We manifest God in the obedience to Jesus the Son. We manifest God in the feeling of the Holy Spirit. So when the world sees us and they see the love of God in us and they see the actions of God in us and they see the prayers that are being answered through the church that are being prayed, they see us a manifestation of God on earth. And so he has left us here to be his hand, his feet, his working functional church on earth until he comes again. So that leads me to three additional questions this morning, and I'll give them to you very quickly here, through verses 18 through 26 that I want to address. Question number one, who does God manifest himself to? Who does God manifest himself to? Number two, why does God manifest himself to them? And number three, how does God manifest himself to them? Who does God manifest himself to? Why does God manifest himself to them? And how does God manifest himself to them? Look at verse number 21. Who does God manifest himself to? The answer is this, verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Now, theologically, doctrinally, this is a, a tough text, as well as the rest of the chapter. It's not that tough, but a, a lot of people really struggle over some of these passages, those that are of the... Um, legalistic persuasion that believe in some form of a works salvation, that you need to earn merit in order to go to heaven. There's something that you have to do. Keep the Ten Commandments to be baptized. You, you have to go through, you know, participate in communion or, or something. There's always a long list. If you do these things, you'll, you'll have peace with God, and your sins will be forgiven, and your name will be written in the book of life, and, and you'll have entrance into heaven because of the good deeds that you do. They love to take passages like this and use this to defend themselves. When it says, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So they love to take verses like this and say, it's those who keep his commandments. That's the ones that he loves. And he will reveal himself to them. Some of you, your Bible translation doesn't use the, the term manifest. It uses the word reveal. Same thing here. It will be, God will reveal himself to those who keep his commandments. 
Of course, that's not at all what this is saying, is it? The commandments is not the basis of which God reveals himself. It is the evidence by which God will reveal himself. He says, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. You see, he who loves Jesus is the one who is exercising the commandments of God. But love is, at, is what is at the core here. It is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father. That's the condition. You love Jesus, those who love Jesus will be loved by God the Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. I will reveal myself to him. I will, I will be God to that individual. I will save, I will redeem, I will restore, I will sanctify, I will lead, I will guide that individual who loves me. And the Father will love him as well. That is the condition. Now, for some of you already, that, that may cause a predicament for you. You might argue, now wait a minute, you are a good, evangelical, solid Bible teacher, and I know you, Pastor Dan, I have heard you for years teaching that it is by faith, not of works, that the just are justified by faith and not of works, and that it's... And so if you're saying it's those who love God, then, then you're, you're adding a work, and it's not a faith. And the argument that I want to make this morning, or at least attempt to by showing a few passages of Scripture, is that faith and love, often with the teachings of Jesus particularly, and also with the Apostle Paul, are interchangeable. I did an exercise with myself this morning. I went through a lot, lot of different passages of Scripture, and you could almost... Whenever the subject is dealing with salvation and faith and love, you could almost take and vice versa use those two words simultaneously. And they are often used that way in the New Testament. And perhaps we'll look at a couple. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, verse number 9 says this, But as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who have faith in him. Well, wait a minute, I misquoted that. Not at all what he said. He says, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Now, love and faith are one and the same in this text. God has prepared wonderful, glorious things in heaven for those who, yes, have faith in him, but those who love him. And what, what you need to understand is that faith and love are two sides of the same coin. Just as repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin. You cannot have biblical faith without true, genuine repentance. And you cannot have true faith in Jesus without also simultaneously having genuine love for him as well. As Jesus told his disciples once, you cannot love God and mammon. Or you cannot love God and things. You, cannot, you, you can't mix the two. If you're with me, that means you love me. And if you love me, that means you believe me. And if you believe me, that means you're obedient to me. If you're there in John chapter 14, turn, turn a couple of pages over and go to John chapter 16. John 16. In verse number 27 of John 16, Jesus says, For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. Now, there's a condition that's laid there. Did you notice that? He's, he says, for the Father himself loves you, and the condition is because you have loved me. Of course, you could go to 1 John and argue it's in, in, in light of eternity, it's actually the other way around. We love him because he first loved us. He loved us first in eternity past, and then we responded to that love. It, you know, just as Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not, have, uh, should not perish but have everlasting life. So that the love was initiated by God, and you responded to his love with love, and those who respond to his love with love, he loves them. In John chapter 15, you can go back a page or two. John 15 and verse number 23, Jesus, Jesus presents this in kind of the negative versus the positive. He says, he who hates me hates, or, or he who hates me hates my father also. 
So he doesn't even use the word love. It's the negative perspective here. If you hate Jesus, you hate God. And if you hate, if you love Jesus, you love God. That's the opposite of that. And so it's, it's one of the same here. You, you cannot, either you love Jesus or you don't love Jesus. And if you, if you love Jesus, you have faith in Jesus. And if you love Jesus, you're obedient to Jesus. And the fact that you love Jesus, the evidence of it is shown in the works that you do for him. And the, and the belief that you have in him. John chapter 3 and verse number 18. Jesus speaking to Nicodemus says this. He who believes in him is not condemned. Let me pause there for a moment. So Jesus tells Nicodemus, if you believe in me, your faith renders you no longer condemned in the eyes of God. So your faith has moved you from condemnation to justification. So if you believe, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So that's verse number 18. The very next verse, verse number 19 says this. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Now, he said two opposite things there, but both of them are simultaneously true. Verse number 18, he says, condemnation is brought about by unbelief. In verse number 19, he says, And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light. By the way, Jesus is the light. He's the light of the world. He's presented as the light in John chapter number 1. So he's referring to Jesus here. Jesus has come into the world, and you did not love him. That's what condemns you. So in two verses, he is saying, You are condemned eternally, to the wrath of God in hell because you do not believe in Jesus. And in the very next verse, he says, and the condemnation is based off of the fact that you do not love Jesus. It's the same thing. It's two sides of the same coin. It is because you do not believe and you do not love. In fact, look this up sometime if you have a Bible uh, word search uh, app. Faith and love, how often that emerges, how often Paul and other New Testament writers use that. Faith and love, faith and love, faith and love, so, so often used together. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse number 22, Paul says this, If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be cursed. He didn't say anything about not believing or having faith, although that is equally true, but he, he looks at it from the perspective of love. If you don't love Jesus, you are cursed in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 10, Paul says, And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. In this text, he's talking about the future, the end times here. And because they rejected the truth of God's word, and the way he words it here is they did not love the truth. They did not, in Jesus being the truth... I am the way, the truth. He is the source of truth. He is the logos. He is the word of God. Because they did not love the truth, which Christ is the truth. They did not love Christ. They are condemned. In James chapter 2, you're all very familiar with this text. James makes this play, and he presents that there's this audience in this Judaistic church there in Jerusalem that says, well, You know, I have works and that's good enough. I'm obedient to the law. I'm doing the things that a good Jew would do. And so James says in James chapter 2, verse number 17, Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? In other words, if you say that you have faith and yet there's no external evidence that proves that you really do have faith, there's no evidence that you are obedient, there's no evidence that you are following and pursuing God, then you don't really have faith. That's just, um, it's a facade. It's it's, false. it's a false claim. It's a false, um, 
It's a false position to say, I'm a Christian, but then you don't do anything that a Christian does. You're just saying, it's just empty words. It's hypocrisy. And James says there's a lot of hypocrites in the church. They claim to have faith in Jesus, but they're not obedient. And you cannot have one without the other. Faith without works is dead. The same is equally true when it comes to love. To say that you have faith in Jesus, but you don't love Jesus, tells me that you don't have faith in Jesus. You, it is, it's not one or the other. It is two sides of the same coin. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 6, Paul says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. Now that is a very doctrinally dense phrase there. Faith working through love. The NLT renders that last phrase this way. Faith expressing itself through love. When you have faith in Jesus, it expresses itself by the love of God that is poured out on your hearts. This is why Jesus, in the text that we looked at just a week or two ago, when he told his disciples, By this will all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That, that is the litmus test. That is... That is the key, that is the quintessential way of which the world will know that you truly have faith, that you truly are followers of Christ, that you have truly been converted, that you have love for one another. And why is that? Why is that the case? Why is love the, the key test? Why is love the, the, the parameter by which we can test ourselves on whether or not we truly do believe in Jesus? The reason is, is because Romans chapter 5 tells us that it is the love of God that is poured out in our hearts. In Romans chapter 5, verse number 1, he says that we are justified by faith apart from the works of the law. It is our faith in Jesus that justifies us, that makes us right in the eyes of God. And it is the actions by which we live in those faith that produces the love of God, which, by the way, he tells us in verse number 5, I believe it is, it is that love of God which is poured out in your hearts by the Holy Spirit. Now, this is key right here. The fruit of the Spirit is this. So, in Galatians chapter number 5, Paul makes this argument to the audience there in the, the, the region of Galatia. He says, if you really want to know if you are a born-again believer, if you really want to know if you belong to Christ, if you really want to know that you're a Christian, look at the fruits in your life. He begins that chapter by listing some of the fruits of those who are not in Christ. And it's, it's the list of the common sins of humanity. He says, if these are the things that are of normality in your life, if, if you're exercising these things on a daily basis, then it doesn't matter whether or not you say, I believe in Jesus. Your works are proven you don't. But if you truly have been converted, if the Holy Spirit has regenerated your heart, and He has converted you, and He is dwelling in you, there will be the evidence of that, and the evidence of that is called the fruit of the Spirit. And I believe it's... It's not presented in the plural, though. He doesn't say the fruits of the Spirit. He says the fruit of the Spirit. But then he gives a list. And the reason I think it's in the singular there is because he says, at the beginning of that list, he says the fruit of the Spirit is love. Love's the first thing. The love of God has been poured out on our hearts. And how is the love of God manifested? It was manifested through joy, and it's manifested through long-suffering and gentleness and peace, and all these other things that are listed in this, this list of the fruit of the Spirit. But all of that is a manifestation of the love of God that has been poured out on our hearts. And so I think it's very clear that what Jesus is telling his disciples is this. Those who love me will also be those who keep my commands. And those who love me and keep my commands are those who truly believe in me. Those are the people who have genuine faith, who have been genuinely converted, not because of some words that they have said, not because of some magical phrase. In Islam today, you can say you know, the magical little prayer and you're in, you're, you're, you're Islamic, but that's not the way Christianity works. There's no sinner's prayer that converts your soul. 
There is the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit that draws you in and illuminates your eyes to the truth of Jesus and the sin that's within your own depraved heart. It draws you into a state of confession and faith. It it leads you to the point of longing and desiring Jesus to be your Savior. And it, it illuminates you to the life that only He can bring. And so he says, if the Holy Spirit is in you and He has illumined, illumined your eyes and He has regenerated your dead spirit and you are now in love with God, you will be obedient to Him. You will believe in Him. And that is the evidence. That is the evidence. Romans chapter 8, verse number 28 says this. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. He didn't say to those who believe in God, although that's true. It's the same truth, once again. But it's to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. 1 Corinthians 13, verse number 13, Paul said, And now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Faith, hope, Love. The greatest, though, is love. Early, earlier in that chapter, he even made the argument that though I had all faith but didn't have love, it is nothing. And so everything that God does is from the basis of love. This is one of the reasons why John will later on in his writings in 1 John, he will give, he will give God one of just a handful of definitions. The Bible doesn't give a lot of definitions of of God, but this is one very clear definition of God given in Scripture. And the definition that John gives of God in 1 John is this, God is love. And because the very essence of God is love, the, the basis by which everything God does is love. God saves you for His own love's sake. This is what Ephesians 1 tells us. Ephesians 1 is a very very theologically, doctrinally dense chapter when it comes to soteriology or the study of our salvation. And it's very clear in that chapter that it is for his own good pleasure that he saves us. He has chosen us. He has predestined us. He has set us apart for himself. It is a love he has for us. A love that he has for us. And he expects us to, to respond to him in love. That's what true worship is. We talk about worship on Sunday mornings. That you do realize that worship is, in its essence, is really nothing more than singing love songs back to a God that loves you. It is, it is a God who has expressed and showed his love to you in so many different ways throughout your life, and you were responding back to him by the, the glory and the worship and the praise and the love that he rightfully deserves. So, number one this morning, who does God manifest himself to? He manifests himself to those who love him. I need to close this up. Verse number 22, very quickly here. Why does God manifest himself to them? In verse number 22, we're introduced to a very unknown disciple. His name is Judas. And don't be confused. John lets us know this is not Iscariot. This is not Judas Iscariot. This is not Judas, the one who betrayed him. There are two Judases in the 12 apostles. This is a Judas that, this is the only time he speaks in the New Testament. In other places, he is referred to as Thaddeus. He is the son of Simon. And I thought long and hard over this this morning. I do not believe there is a deeper and more profound question posed by any of the disciples than the one that Judas poses here. The question that Judas asked in verse 22 is this, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Now, you may not initially catch how deep that is, but this is very profound. Some Bible scholars tend to think that he's talking about, maybe he's he's thinking, well, Jesus is referring to the kingdom, and how come you're, you're going to show us the kingdom, but you're not going to show the rest of the world the kingdom, or you're going to make it a small kingdom, and I don't think that is the case at all. I think Judas here is very quietly listening, very intently listening to what Jesus is saying, and he's understanding it. This is one of those rare cases. And we've heard Peter speak in this chapter already. 
We've heard Thomas speak in this chapter already. We've heard Philip speak in this chapter already. None of them got it. They, they just they weren't following along with Jesus and what he was teaching. But when Judas speaks here, it's very clear. Judas is following what Jesus is saying. Judas is listening. Judas is understanding. And the question that Judas is pro proposing here is the same question that those that are... Um, those that are critics of Christianity have, have, have had an issue with for 2,000 years now. Because Judas understands that what Jesus is implying here is that only those who love Jesus will God reveal himself to. And Judas sits there and thinks, oh, wait a minute. Not everybody knows Jesus. And even those that, I mean, clearly they've been in Jerusalem for a long time now, and half of the people hate him. They despise him, so they don't love Jesus. And are you implying, Jesus, that the vast majority of the world is not going to know you, live because of you, because they don't love you? That's, that's getting to the heart of what Judas... Are you not going to reveal yourself to everyone? It's a heavy question. You, you are God. You can save anybody. You can reveal yourself to anybody. You can do whatever you want to do. Why not just forgive the whole world? Why not just forgive everybody at one time? If your sacrifice on the cross is sufficient for all of mankind, then just let it naturally apply to all mankind. Let it be universal. Let there be universal salvation. Why only reveal yourself to a few? This is not a new message, by the way. Jesus has already taught his disciples that broad is the way that leads to destruction and narrow is the path that leads to eternal life. This is, this is a, not a new truth, but it's a, it's a truth that is really beginning to sink in with his disciples who have this idea that all of the world is going to follow Jesus and Jesus is reiterating once again, no, not all of the world is going to follow me. Because I'm not going to reveal myself to all of the world. I am going to reveal myself to those who love me. There is a condition. And by the way, there is a condition of salvation. Yes, the blood of Christ is sufficient for all of mankind. The Bible, I believe, teaches that. I know that's a controversial thing to say. But I do believe that it is the atonement of Christ is universal. It is sufficient for all of mankind. But there is a condition by which that atonement is applied. The condition is faith, and you could argue this morning, love. Not everyone that Jesus died for will be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God gave his life for the world. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 3, I believe, he tells us that he did not die just for the elect, but for all mankind. So everyone, he died for all. He made a sacrifice for all. But that sacrifice is not automatically applied to all. That's called universalism. And that's taught even today. There are many false teachers that would, that would say, well, Jesus died for all, therefore all are saved. Even the Hitlers and the, the child molesters and the murderers and all the bad people that you can think of, they're all automatically saved because he died for all. And we're all sinners. But it's very clear in Scripture. It is without question in Scripture. There is a condition by which you are saved. It is faith in Jesus. Hebrews 11 and verse number 6 says this, But without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. God rewards those who diligently seek Him in faith. And, and as He says in that text there, that is the only way to please Him. If you want to please God, you're not going to be able to accomplish that through the deeds of the law. This is why in the book of Romans it says, by the Romans chapter 3 and verse number 20, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified. There are no actions that you can perform physically by obe being obedient to God's law that can bring you into a state of justification. You cannot make yourself right with God by doing right things. It's impossible. The only way you can make yourself right with God and have peace with God is to have faith in God and love of God. 
We say those are two separate things, and I'm arguing this morning they're not. They're the same. They're one and the same. So notice Jesus' answer, verse 23. We could argue this morning that he will reveal himself only to those who believe him. But Jesus gives Judas here the same answer that he just gave in the preceding verses. The previous verses, rather. He says in verse number 23, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the words which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So Jesus virtually says the same thing over again. Thomas, or Judas rather says, how is it that you're not going to reveal yourself to all the world? And the answer is because not all of the world is going to, believe, is going to love me. Not all of the world is going to love me. If anyone loves me, though, he will be loved of my Father. There's so much more that I could say in this text, but for time's sake, I want to read these last couple of verses before we head home. Go to verse 25. Last question this morning. How does God manifest himself to them? How does God manifest himself to us? The answer is through the work of the Holy Spirit. Through the work of the Holy Spirit. Notice what he says in verse number 25. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. What Jesus tells his disciples here is this. Those who will, God will manifest himself to will be those that the Holy Spirit works on. It will be the ones that the Holy Spirit leads into truth. In verse number 17, he calls the Spirit the Spirit of truth. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be with you. He will be with you doing what? He will be with you leading you into truth. That's what the Spirit does. This is why he's referred to as the Spirit of truth. He guides you. He helps you to understand truth. He opens your eyes to truth. He convicts you of the truth of the Scripture. He, he, he brings you to a place that you can see the truth of Jesus Christ. And so he says in verse number 26, once again, the helper. That's a very interesting Greek word. Only John uses, uses that word in the New Testament. Its most basic meaning is this. It's one who is summoned to come alongside and assist or to help. In some of your Bibles, it's called the comforter. In some of your translations, it may refer to him as the, the counselor, the advocate. There's, there's all kinds of other ways that you could word it. it, it it's anything and everything that is necessary to bring you into understanding, to help you along. He says that's what the Holy Spirit does. This is the work of the Holy Spirit, by the way. And this is why the Holy Spirit is later on referred to by the Apostle Paul as the Spirit of Christ. The Holy Spirit is there to bring you to Christ, to open your eyes to Christ, to propel you to Christ so that you will love Christ, so that you will know Christ. He says, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Notice what he, he does here. There's two things he does. He will teach you all things. He will teach you all things. The Holy Spirit is the one who teaches us. I, you know, I read this story a couple of years ago about a world-renowned atheist, and I was really shocked when he told me, or he didn't tell me, but I, the article I was reading, said that one of the first things that he does every morning is he reads a chapter of the Bible. He's a much better atheist than some of you are Christians. He reads the, a chapter of the Bible every day, and yet he's an atheist. And why is it that an atheist can read a chapter of the Bible every day and not understand what he's reading? and not see who Jesus is? How is it that there are so many people in the world that can know so much about the gospel? I'll never forget when I was in Israel, one of our tour guides was a man by the name Kenny. Kenny was a walking genius. He was brilliant, perhaps the smartest man I have ever met in person. He knew everything about everything. He, he was like 
I have never met someone so I had never met someone that could articulate the Christian doctrine so clearly. I never met someone who understood how Jesus fulfilled all of the messianic promises to the T. I never saw someone that could explain the New Testament in such great in-depth, great clarity. And yet Kenny was an atheist. He was a Jewish man who had no belief in Judaism or in Christianity. But yet he knew the Bible inside and out. And I would argue, I think Kenny knows the Bible way better than I know the Bible. And I feel like after, you know, many decades of studying and teaching the Bible that I I have a a fair grasp on it. But I, I, I feel like a child sitting under his teaching. And yet he's an atheist. How is that? How could that possibly be? That befuddled my mind for a long time until I realized... You can know the truth of the Scripture, but if the Holy Spirit doesn't open your eyes to its spiritual truth, you're still blinded. You're still walking around in your trespasses and sins. You're still in darkness spiritually. It is the Holy Spirit that will teach you all things. He also tells them at the end of verse number 26, and bring you to remembrance of all things that I said to you. After his resurrection and the fulfilling of the Holy Spirit, they were able to pin the Scriptures. They were able to remember the things that Jesus taught. They were able to preserve for us 2,000 years later the things that God wanted us to learn. And the same is true for us today. We say, well, God doesn't give us new revelation or inspire us to write new biblical truth, but the Holy Spirit still guides us into the truth of Scripture. The Holy Spirit is what leads us to know and to understand Jesus Christ. And so these questions here about God manifesting himself are very relevant. I didn't tell you this at the beginning. I probably should have. I should have warned you. This is going to be a teaching sermon, not an inspirational talk, not a, not a peppy, short little you know, pep talk. And I don't apologize for that. I never will. In Acts chapter 2, the early church continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. One of the reasons why the early church was so successful is because they grounded themselves in the truth of God's word. They, They were like the Bereans who went home and they studied the scriptures daily to see if those things were true. One of the reasons our country is in the condition that it's in and our world is in the condition that it's in is because we have illiterate, biblically illiterate Christians. They don't know the doctrine of Scripture. They don't know the theology of Jesus Christ. They don't, you could have read those verses of Jesus and not have understood them whatsoever. It is needful, whether you want it or not, whether you like it or not, whether you like sitting here and listening to some boring lecture for over an hour, whether you agree with that or not, it is what you need. You need this, desperately need this. Our country is spiritually dying because of the lack of being fed God's Word. And it is no different than in the Old Testament when you had the prophet who said of the nation of Israel, my people perish for lack of understanding. They don't know God's Word. We live in a time when people don't know God's Word. But it's mainly because they don't know God. They don't know the Holy Spirit that has drawn them and illuminated them. My prayer for you this morning is this. Maybe you've sat here and you've thought to yourself, well, do I truly love Jesus? Do I really truly have faith in Him? Has the Holy Spirit drawn me into truth? Has has the Holy Spirit illuminated my eyes to the truth of Jesus Christ? And if you're questioning that, I want to pray and I want to invite you to spend some time before God yourself pray and say, Lord, Holy Spirit, open my eyes, draw me, change me, convert me, make me into your child, manifest yourself to me. I want to see you, I want to know you, and I want to live with you. I hope that's all of our prayer this morning. Let's pray. Lord, My heart's desire is that every single soul in this room would love you with all of their mind, body, and heart. That every fiber of their being would believe in you, trust you, have faith in you, and love you. 
Holy Spirit, I pray that You would do Your regenerating work. Open eyes. Open eyes to the truth. Open eyes to the Gospel. Pray, God, that You would, for us as Christians who have not done our due diligence of studying Your Word, bring conviction this morning that we would wake up every morning more so than that atheist who reads a chapter every day. I pray that we would be on our knees and in Your Word, loving You, knowing You, spending time with You. Pray, God, that You would transform the American church. Turn it upside down. Reprove and rebuke, Lord, I pray. Transform our lives so that we would live this, leave this place today living as true ambassadors of You, living out the love of God that has been poured out in our hearts. Help us, I pray, God, to do that and to give You all the honor that You richly deserve. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.